Sorry for the interruption, and let's get the Mr. Brooks on. Um, Um, we're going to talk a little bit more at a, at a marketing level, on a higher level um, than, than the previous conversation. And I wanted to kind of share with you kind of our view of cloud computing and really what it means. And what it means to the way that every business will serve their customers because we think that it's really important in the future, it, more, than, more than ever, to be a customer-focused company. And so, um, when the previous speaker was talking about the evolution of the industry, you know, they talked about mainframe computers and client-server computers, and then today, it seems like it's all about cloud. I'll tell you that in 1999, um, when Salesforce got started, people thought the cloud was, was ridiculous. There was no way that we were going to have cloud computing, and they fought against it. Uh, very, very heavily, but I've uh, got to hand it to Mark Benioff and the company. They really built a company that was uh, quite impressive from, uh, from scratch in 1999 to we just finished three billion dollars in revenue uh, in, in the, last, uh, the last year. Nobody thought that cloud computing could do that and that's all that, all that we do is cloud computing. Um, I want to also uh, give a commercial for giving back. And so one of the things that we do at the company that we think is really important is to think about how you can, as a business, give back to the community. And so one of the things that we do is we give 1% of our profit, 1% of our stock, and 1% of our employees' time to anything they want to work for. We don't have, um, you know, we don't have blessed uh, charities. If you happen to to want to deal with a particular charity, you can do that and you will match your funds. You can work 20 hours a year uh, for that, that charity, fully paid. And so this is a, just a, a, an advertisement to say if you're incorporating this into your company, I think it, it really makes your employees feel like they're doing good. So thank you for that commercial uh, sponsorship. Um, the computing revolution, again, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty clear in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. People tend to, people overestimate what they can get done in two or three years. You say, well, in two or three years I can do this. And you never can, you never quite get there. But in 10 years, if you try to predict what's gonna happen in 10 years, you never can predict that. It's always, we always do better in 10 years for some reason. So every 10 years, something truly amazing is coming out into this industry. In the 2000s, it was the phone. And now it's definitely, it's, it's social, it's, it's Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. If somebody would have told you about Twitter, you know, five years ago, it was like, what, 140 characters? That just doesn't make sense. But we see all of this as ways of connecting with your customer. And so we think that uh, connecting with your customer is really important. And the trends that the previous speaker talked about are here. Take a look at this. We think that social is important, touch, local, understanding where your people are, uh, big data identity, e the ecosystem in the community, and of course, all of that running on cloud computing is really where things are going. And so the social revolution is really about people sharing with each other, interest groups sharing with each other, and so uh, sharing profiles. And I never thought that I would have my daughter's Facebook friend and be able to see what she's going, these parties that she's going to and the pictures taken at these parties. That's a little bit uh, disturbing sometimes. But you can't unfriend your daughter. That just does, no, that doesn't work. Um, the touch revolution, touch is more than just mobile. Touch is about the way that you interact with computers. Right, it used to be you mouse, right? You, you have the mouse and your hand is like this all the time and you're, you know, you're typing and then you're doing this, right? And the touch revolution is all about with the iPad now, it's about touching and squeezing and swiping, right? To the point where I saw this YouTube video the other day that was amazing, this two-year-old girl, two-year-old girl is sitting there with a magazine on her lap. She's got a magazine on her lap and she goes to the picture and she does this. <laughs> because she wants the picture to get bigger, right? Her idea was that that magazine was broken. 
the magazine was useless because it couldn't increase the size of the picture, right? So kids just have a completely different view. You walk up to a television now and you touch it, you want to do things with it, right? So touch has become a revolution. Local, you've got GPS on your phone and now no matter where you are, you can say, where's the nearest Starbucks? You know, where's the nearest Chinese restaurant for me to go eat in? And uh, even in Paris, France, I want to have Chinese because I like Chinese, thank you very much. <laughs> right, so where is the next Chinese restaurant? Um, but it's all about local. If you don't know, if you don't take advantage of knowing where your customer is at the time, then your product is probably not taking its full advantage. You can know where the customer is, you can know where the product is, take advantage of location. Also big data, we just heard about that. Uh, GE is one of our customers and their jet engine group. Uh, we were in a meeting the other day and they were telling us their jet engines stream data, stream information down to their big data solution continuously. So every engine that's in the sky is calling home and telling the system how well it's doing. So big data is here, right? And, and the speaker talked about um, the kinds of things that you need to process this. And you're right, you know, the pipe is really, really big. And so you need to be able to account for that. Identity revol uh, revolution. I, how many people have a Facebook account? Facebook account? How many people use their Facebook account to sign in to other services? Right? We got this. It, it gets a little bit uh, interesting sometimes, but within our, within our company, the worst thing in the world is I'm in the middle of an enterprise application, I'm doing something in sales, and then I want to go over to my HR system, and I have to launch another application, and I have to sign in my identity, and it's probably the same username and password, but I'm constantly typing passwords over and over. No, you don't want to do that. You want to have one identity. Wouldn't it be great I have one identity, and I can get into all of the stuff that I need, but it's secure, right? It's secure, that's the key idea. And it's about communities. And you see this in this group today. You have a community here. Some of the people in this community also belong to other communities, right? But it's about finding and defining your communities. In enterprise software, it used to be that you had customer service portals. And then I had partner portals. And then I had supply chain portals, right? And these are portals that I'm doing to get to these people that do business with me. But today is different. Today you have a community because I may have my partners may be helping to support my customers. And my suppliers may need to get the information about my partners and customers to help them with the supply chain. So today it's not about a very rigid supply chain and partner portal and customer portal. It's about creating communities where your customers and your partners and your suppliers, everybody is together in that community. And that way you serve your customer much better. And it's about ecosystems. How many people have bought something from the App Store or the Android Store, right, for your phone, right? Most people have bought some kind of an application. Today, if you get a product and that product can have apps on it, you, you expect it's gotta have a store. So if you're offering a product, if your company is offering a product, even if it's B2B, you're gonna, people are gonna expect there's some way of interacting and going to a store to get what you want. I run the government um, advisor, I run the customer advisory panels for Salesforce for the platform as a certain idea of this platform as a service. And I run the government advisory panel and the government is even looking at creating their own app store for the software that the government uses to run the country, right? So it's a trend that everyone expects that even within your own company, if you need, especially with mobile, right? If I'm a new employee and I come on board, I want to be able to get my phone and I want to have all my applications on it. Where do I go to get those applications? Well, you should have, you should have a store where you provision your users with the stuff that you want to allow them to use, right? And that's, people just expect that today. And it's also about the cloud, and it's about having uh, you know, everything running there on the cloud and available to you. But the, the thing that we see, though, is there's many customers that are disconnected from their companies. There's a chasm between them. 
So the question is, how do you become a customer company? How do you make your company much more customer focused? And the thing is, you have to connect with your customers in a whole new way. And there's eight questions that we want to ask on how to become a customer, really a customer focused company. The first is, do you listen to every customer? With Twitter today, with Facebook today, with all of the different services that are out there today, with Yelp today, you know, your customers are not telling you when they have a problem. Your customers are telling everybody when they have a problem. They go to Twitter and they complain about the service that they got, or they complain about how their computer that they just got is just crap, right? If you're not listening, you're in trouble because those people expect that when you're when they complain about something, that somebody's going to come in and do something about it. Now, I'll give you a great example from the early days. A friend of ours, a friend of mine, a colleague, went to the San Francisco Zoo, and he was at the San Francisco Zoo one day with his family. But the lion and the elephants that were the most important animals that they wanted to see were, I guess, on vacation or they were changing their cage or something, but they got to the most important places they wanted to visit and there was no animals there. So on the way out of the door, I mean, he's going out the door and he's going, oh, there's no elephants, there's no tigers, you know, and he's tweaking this thing as he's walking away. All day run at the zoo. We got to see the penguins, but no elephants, right? Five minutes after he left the zoo, he got an email message or a tweet return back from the San Francisco Zoo apologizing that you were unhappy and giving them free tickets so that their family could come back when the elephants and tigers were back. Now, was he still angry at the San Francisco Zoo? No. He felt, oh my God, they care and they did something about this. So I may have just ruined the day, but I'm going to go back because i got free tickets. You've got to create communities. You've got to find special interest groups where people share common goals and common concerns, and those people work together. You can communicate to them in a particular way. All your customers are not the same. All your customers are You can segment your customers into different kind of communities, and that will help, help to uh, know what's important to them. So if I'm communicating with that community, and I'm communicating them in a particular way, then they don't think it's spam because that, that message is focused to that community. So if you can partition your customers into multiple small communities and communicate with them more personally, then they're going to think that everything they see from you, every communication they see from you is actually relevant. It's not garbage. Your products are going to have to communicate. I don't care whether it's a router whether it's a, um, you know, a, an HVAC unit, I don't care. Anything in the future that you've got is going to have to call home and going to have to let you know how it's doing. Um, you can deliver apps anywhere. Co how many people have seen the Coca-Cola machine, the freestyle Coca-Cola machine? Have you guys ever seen one of those? This machine allows you to mix your own drink. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't have rum or vodka or any of that stuff. It's just got, you know, Coca-Cola and cherry and syrup and Dr. Pepper kinds of stuff in it. And so you basically, if you like cherry Coke, but it's a little bit too sweet, you can dial down the sweet. Or if there's a little bit too much cherry, you can dial down the cherry. And what happens? Next time you walk up to that particular Coke machine, your phone talks to the Coke machine and says, Hey, that way, Lila. <laughs> Get his drink ready. <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate it. I hope you can see that, that this really this whole concept was about how do you become a better customer company and how do we all communicate and connect with each other in a much better way and all of us will be more successful that way. Thank you.